after four election victories on the trot, the New South Wales Labor government's 15-year reign is entering a spectacular end game. There's an ever-growing whiff of scandal. Political donations, corruption findings, sacked ministers and continuous leadership speculation. And the government seems unable to do anything about it. It's been an unholy mess and uh, what we've demonstrated today as a party is that we recognise that it's been a mess. The state's new Premier and his government have become objects of ridicule. When is this uh, tawdry soap opera going to end? Do you accept that uh, through ill discipline, your party in government has discredited itself in the eyes of the public of New South Wales? Yes. While the New South Wales government tears itself apart, there's chaos on the roads, and the city rail network is bursting at the seams. Over 10 years, successive Labor Premiers have made grand promises. It represents the foundations for public transport for the city in the next century. Today, we start a public transport revolution. Uh, do we have the, uh, do we have the plan? The map? Okay. But so far, the grand promises and visions have amounted to virtually nothing. Another election promise that, that, that never delivers. We've tried for years and years and years to get something done about it. There's now quite a deep degree of cynicism in the whole area. Well, Sydney faces very tremendous challenges. You've got congestion costs that cost the state economy more than $12 million a day in lost productivity. <laughs> On Four Corners tonight, how the New South Wales government has betrayed voters by failing to deliver the most basic of services, adequate public transport. Friday morning. Business analyst Adrian Hart is about to begin the first leg of a long journey to work. He lives 30 kilometres away, but it'll take him a full two hours to get there. If I miss it, I have to walk a kilometre or so to another street and uh, wait about 30 minutes for another bus. Adrian lives in Borkham Hills in the city's northwest one of the fastest growing parts of Sydney, and we join him on a day of travelling to and from work in North Sydney. The only way Adrian can get to work is to catch two buses, both privately run. There are no trains. By the time he gets home tonight, it'll have been a round trip of 12 hours, eight hours at work, plus another four on the buses. Thanks, driver. On bus number 615, it's standing room only. Where are we going to sit? Uh, sit up the back. Um, yeah, it doesn't appear to be a seat today. Is it like this? You're going to have to stand the whole way? Yeah. Oh. Hi, Abel. Hi, Abel. <laughs> you got a seat. You're lucky. <laughs> Adrian's friend Abel has already scored a seat. Sorry. Back door. 20 minutes later, it's time to get off and join bus number 612 to North Sydney. The queue is known as the 612 shuffle. Are we going to get a seat? I don't know. Pretty much full. Yeah. It's usual, is it? Yeah. It's always late, but not officially late. It's unofficially late. Uh, just the fact that we're travelling on full buses and it's usually a full bus and they have to keep trying to add more buses and they get full. I think there's a big demand out here for public transport. I mean, I, I think people really want it. And, you know, they just get left out. Do you guys sit and complain to each other every morning? Pretty much. <laughs> it helps pass the time. I'll see ya.
Just two kilometres away in the next suburb, Castle Hill, live the Bell family, Garth, Sue and son Lachlan. This part of Sydney has the highest rate of car ownership in the country. The Bells have got one each, plus Lachlan's work ute, which makes four. A plumber by trade, Lachlan works in Gladesville. It's a 17 kilometre trip, which takes 40 minutes. And it's bumper to bumper all the way. Yeah, we're just coming onto the M2. The, the car, car parking lot will begin again, as you can see. How long does it usually take you in peak out? At 9am, Sue Bell drives off to see her mother, who lives in a nursing home 30 kilometres away. Her only way to get there is by car, via privately run toll roads. The bill this month, the lock and the mine combined, just for the two of us, was $500 for the month. They're trying to tell us to get cars off the road. Um, well, you know, they've got to do something to make it viable, haven't they? Because I suppose, by choice, would you have four cars in the garage? Probably not, no. There it goes again. Exactly. <laughs> it's like a little reminder. It is, it is. At five o'clock, Garth Bell decides to call it quits for the day and start the bumper-to-bumper -bumper drive home. On a bad day, three, four kilometres I live from work, on a bad day, it can take up to 20 minutes to get home, which is crazy. Where was the metro station going? For years, the state government promised to build a railway connecting the northwest to the rest of the city. Finally, last year, Garth thought it would happen. We uh, were called to a meeting around the corner here. They had the plans, they had a model. Um, they were there for, I think, a week. We just went, wow, this is great. And uh, they've been promising this one for 20 years. I don't know what happens every time, but um, there's something strange that it gets canned every time. Very frustrating. We bought in here and built here. And... Um, on the promise of a railway? On the promise of a railway. And that was on... I mean, it's on the original plans. I believe it's been on plans for 20 years. Um, so you made an investment decision based on the absolutely, railway? Absolutely. There you go. At around the same time, Adrian Hart heads home on the 612 to Borkham Hills. Thank you, thank you. This is for driving me home from the bus stop this week, Tony. Abel and Adrian have been catching the bus with this group for a couple of years now. They've all become friends. When I leave work, I get pretty excited that I'm going to see all my bus buddies and things. Quizzes kill the time. Okay, Adam Savage and Jamie... Heinemann star on which TV series? Well done. The on again, off again railway is never far from the conversation. Did you ever believe one was going to Yeah, of course, until they kept saying no, 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 no. Again this year, it will come in. Definitely, we're going to start building by this year. We're going to start digging at this time. And the fact, about how they set the dates that yeah, we'll start digging here, we'll do this. Yeah, actually, thought it was going to happen. And the TV advertisements and everything. They had, they had the whole TV campaign. Thank you. So, how are you feeling right now? Oh, I'm tired, but it was good to get a seat. Um, and good to see those guys. You to get a seat. All right. Thanks very much for letting us come along and drop into your world. Ah, oh, welcome to my world. Okay. Okay. See you later. Okay. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. See you. Bye bye. To understand how the nation's premier city developed stranded suburbs, you need to go back to when Bob Carr was Premier. Carr knew that massive investment was needed in public transport. He also knew he needed to sell the state's electricity generators to pay for it. To do that, 
who needed approval from the ALP state conference. Public ownership of power stations has long been a sacred cow for Labor. Bob Carr's scheme never stood a chance. I didn't join the party 18 years ago to follow principles espoused by Jeff Kennett and his like. I've been coming here since I was 15 and that sad level of booing won't intimidate me for one moment. Bob Carr may not have been intimidated, but his plan to privatise electricity was defeated. Some in the ALP have lived to regret that decision. It should have been sold when uh, Carr and Egan floated that in 97. We would have got about $35 billion at the time. The 10-year fully funded construction program. Carr's promises of multi-billion dollar railways to the northwest and the southwest of the city, a train to Bondi Beach, a fast train to Newcastle, even a second crossing of Sydney Harbour, all came to naught. Sydney's stranded suburbs were cut further adrift. By the time Bob Carr bowed out of politics in 2005, barely a sleeper had been laid. By 2008, New South Wales Premier Maurice Yemmer knew that public transport was a problem that could no longer be ignored. He announced an ambitious $12 billion plan to build an underground fast commute metro system out to Sydney's growing northwest. CityLink is the future of Sydney's transport. That's why the New South Wales government is moving ahead with the North West Metro, a world-class, quick, efficient, Euro-style train that will run every few minutes. Your ideas can help with the detailed work now underway. To find out more, go to sidlink.com.au. Authorised by the New South Wales Government City. But to get the Metro, Maurice Yemmer had to find the money. He decided to re-attempt what Bob Carr had tried and failed. He would privatise the state's electricity assets and sink the proceeds into new services. This means that we can direct the taxpayers' funds into hospitals, schools, roads, important transport infrastructure. It, also means it was a decision that would be fatal to his premiership. The decisions that we've arrived at today were not easy ones. Not easy ones for the Labor Party and for the members of the Parliamentary uh, Party as well as the Cabinet. But they are the right decisions, the right decisions for the future of New South Wales. ALP head office didn't quite see it that way. Within hours of the announcement, two of the party's most powerful officials were fronting the media. The unions remain opposed to the government's proposal for privatisation, firstly because we don't believe it's good for working families as consumers in New South Wales, secondly because it's not good for the workers in the industry, and thirdly, this is a government that has no mandate for privatisation of electricity in New South Wales. Standing next to John Robertson was Bernie Reardon, who'd helped defeat Bob Carr's attempt to privatise electricity back in 1997. By now, Bernie Reardon was ALP party president and president of the Electrical Trades Union. But do you still have a working relationship with Morris Young, given have a, how passionate he is about this? I have a very good relationship with Morris Young. What was Bernie Reardon's role in encouraging MPs to defy the Premier on privatisation? Well, I mean, look, uh, Bernie was uh, batting for his side, the ETU, He's also Unfortunately, the president of the ALP. he was also president of the ALP. Uh, uh, I was one of those people that questioned his role, his dual role, and that if he wanted to pursue the ETU line, that he, should, uh, he shouldn't stay as president. Please, 